What's going on, everybody? Welcome back. Episode 22 of the Rough Talk Sports Podcast. I am your host, Kelvin Ruffin Jr. Don't forget the junior. And I'm back once again to talk some more sports with y'all. They say talk is cheap, but here, the Rough Talks is, is worth its weight in gold. So, not much has really happened over the past couple over the past couple weeks. I definitely did miss some time. Work, along with regular everyday life, took up a little bit more time than than I planned on it taking up, so I ended up missing being able to recap week two before week three of the NFL preseason. Olympics are over. I don't really feel like talking about Noah Lyles uh, and Tyreek Hill stuff, you know, them wanting to race each other. But I do have some other interesting topics here. I don't really have many, but I have a couple of other interesting topics. Of course, I can talk football all day. I can talk basketball all day. Nothing has happened with basketball Nothing, of course, baseball is, oh, excuse me, baseball is very alive and well right now. I don't really follow baseball as much. I'm actually working and, and studying more about more about baseball just so I could be able to recap it and keep up with it just for you guys and maybe even teach some other people about baseball who listen to me talk about, you know, football and basketball on a regular basis because that makes me more seasonal than anything. It relatively limits me. I'm not going to lie. But for right now, we will stick to football. Preseason has just officially ended. My biggest takeaways from the preseason. I don't know what to make of the Ravens. I'm starting to second guess how good I think the Ravens are going to be this year. Not because of what I've seen in preseason, but because of kind of they lost Patrick Queen. They lost their defensive coordinator. I do think they'll have a really good defense. But they lost their defensive coordinator. Deshaun Watson has looked relatively well in training camp, and he's 100% healthy. So Freaky Man might actually be back. And the Steelers have a good enough defense to finish 500 every year with no quarterback. And now they have two quarterbacks, which a lot of people say, if you have two starting quarterbacks, you don't have any starting quarterbacks. Well, to me, if you have Russell Wilson and you have Justin Fields, you have an older, more deteriorated version of Justin Fields. But Justin Fields is a younger, much stronger and faster version of Russell Wilson. So if you combine them and the intellect of Russell Wilson, the football IQ of Russell Wilson ends up rubbing off on Justin Fields, along with maybe Russell Wilson become becoming more brave because of seeing how Justin Fields runs and the opportunities that can open up based off of based off of what will open up in their running game, he might have a couple of more plays where he's running a read option. He might scramble a little bit more. He might have some of those opportunities moving forward, but you know, it's just room for imagination really. Lamar Jackson is an MVP. So none of this really has anything to do with him, but there is a bit of feeling that the Ravens might be taking Lamar Jackson for granted. Offensive weapons to a bare minimum, but they do have Zay Flowers. They do have Mark Andrews who's coming back from injury. They do have Derrick Henry. I'm just not 100% sure about the health. Whatever the training, whatever the training facilities are doing has genuinely not been helping out Lamar Jackson at all. Whether he's hurt or everyone around him is hurt, somebody's always hurt on the offense. And the defense has had injury issues as well, but the the defense holds up a lot better than the offense does consistently. So I'm worried about the Ravens. I'm worried about the Steelers because Russell Wilson looked absolutely horrendous week two. He looked really good on that on that one drive in week three, but it's against twos and threes. It's not really he wasn't really going against starters. In the last week of the preseason, which I didn't realize until hearing a lot of the other analysts and and former NFL players talk this week the last week of preseason if you are playing your starters then there is a bit of an issue one of the issues is you aren't healthy through training camp and early in the preseason so you're getting your reps in real time in the last week or you're still not seeing out of your players what you need to see so you're making them play in the last week Brock Purdy falls in that category for me but I think they're going to re-sign Brandon Ayuk. And I think if they don't re-sign him, they're going to re-sign Trent Williams. 
not having Trent Williams and Brandon Ayuk and Christian McCaffrey is 1,000% going to affect Brock Purdy. So when it comes to week one in the regular season, I don't expect him to look how he looks in preseason. The Eagles are also my biggest. Actually, yeah, they are my biggest concern because the Eagles have the highest upside. And based off of how they played last year, they have the furthest plateau. They have the furthest valley to fall down. They flatten out or they descend from the heavens drastically. Meteoric fall, if you will. They played the worst stretch of football last year out of anybody in the NFL, debatably. But they lost in the playoffs to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers with Baker Mayfield at quarterback. That was Baker Mayfield's first year. That NFC South division has been terrible for the last three years, including when Tom was there. Now, Tom did get a Super Bowl out of there, but that's Tom Brady. We just chalked that up to Tom being Tom. After Tom, there's a clear drop-off in the whole division. And the hope of anybody out of that division, it, it seemingly needs to be redistributed for those for that division to be put. <laughs> it needs to be it needs to be reshuffled. The deck of cards for that division needs to be shuffled. Hey, let's let's throw some of these NFC South teams into these other divisions and take some of these other divisions and bring them to the South. I don't know. Let's put let's let's put Washington in the NFC South and let's put Let's let's put Atlanta in the NFC East. I don't know. Let's put Dallas in the NFC South. <laughs> and, and let's put New Orleans in in the NFC in the NFC West. You, let's do something. We gotta shake something up because there is no way the NFC South is as bad as it is. And that team washed the Eagles last year. With all due respect. Because I know there are some Eagles fans that listen to this podcast, as well as my father and a whole side of my family being from Philly. Shout out Philly. It, it it didn't make any sense, and I know Philly fans were disappointed and upset. But this year, Saquon Barkley, who is a very slight upgrade from DeAndre Swift, I'm not going to lie. DeAndre Swift, fast, quick, shifty, big, bulky, and healthy. Saquon Barkley... Fast, shifty, quick, very athletic, not as healthy. He's a little bit faster. He's a little bit quicker. He's a little bit more shiftier. He has a little bit more burst, and he has the potential for explosive plays every time you hand him the ball. DeAndre Swift was going to get you yards, and he could run in the open field, and he could catch out the backfield. So can Saquon Barkley. But I don't know how much of a compromise it really was it's kind of tit for tat because of the system, not really because of the player. So Jalen Hurts is still going to shine. A.J. Brown is going to shine. Devontae Smith is going to shine. I think they have Dallas Goddard. He's going to shine. And they just got Jahan Dotson as well. So they have their burner. He's going to shine. Jahan Dotson might end up looking like the Eagles knew Deshaun Jackson. But again, you have all of these weapons. You lost your center, so I don't know how good the offensive line is going to be because Jason Kelsey was the quarterback without being the quarterback. He could read, he could see, and he could block. He's great at communication, making sure the other offensive linemen are within their assignments. They don't really have that anymore. That safety blanket is gone, and it's just Jalen Hurts now. It's just Jalen Hurts and all of this other talent that's around him. Now, on the defensive side of the ball, you got Devin White as an addition. I think they got C.J. Gardner-Johnson back. So that's another addition. None of that necessarily, once again, helps their bottom line of they lost defensive coordinators, they fired offensive coordinators, and their head coach is the only thing that's constant. That's my worry about the Ravens. Rest in peace to their offensive line coach that I, that um I think I had read just passed away, seventy years old. They could, they could still, they could still maintain. It, it's a difference in rallying people together after a tragedy versus yo. I got a job over here, so the Ravens losing Mike McDonald as their defensive coordinator, huge deal. The Eagles not being able to pull it together after losing all of their coordinators, huge deal. I don't care how many new players you get. If there's no continuity because of coaching, it doesn't really make that much of a difference. So those are my biggest concerns, not because of anything that I saw during the preseason, but just simply because from the last time I saw you, what has changed? The Eagles have made a lot of changes, 
because they paid for a lot of people to come there, but I don't know what I'm going to see because I didn't see anything on the field and I didn't even see or hear anything glowing coming out of camp. Heard that Jalen Hurts didn't throw any interceptions. That doesn't tell me anything good, to be totally honest with you. To me, that can insinuate that he's not taking any risk. That can insinuate that he's afraid to look down the field and throw the ball and say, hey, A.J. Brown is over there. A couple of picks, doesn't matter. Nobody's won MVP without throwing an interception. So that doesn't really matter to me. Let's see what we got next. Well, we're not going. We're not going to leave uh, preseason. We're not going to leave football. Of course, love football too much to leave football. The Falcons haven't really showed me anything. I haven't seen Kirk Cousins, so I don't know what they're going to look like. The Bengals, Joe Burrow looked amazing. The Colts, spotty. Caleb Williams looks incredible, and the Bears look competent. That is one. That is one thing that's important. The Bears look competent. The Chiefs look like the Chiefs. Trevor Lawrence has looked really good in preseason. Does kind of suck that we we kind of had to. We kind of still have to see what Trevor Lawrence looks like at this point, even though he just got paid. I think it was fifty five million dollars a year. Trevor Lawrence in his last game, it was against the Falcons. Eight eight for ten, ninety two yards, two touchdowns. So two drives, two touchdowns. Trevor Lawrence put the ball in the end zone, but somebody is on his heels. And I don't know if anybody's actually been paying attention to this guy or realizing that he's even over there now. Mac Jones is over it is over in Jacksonville now. Mac Jones has had a really, really good preseason over in Jacksonville. Now I don't think it's gonna be a quarterback controversy or competition at any point in time, but if Trevor Lawrence gets hurt the way that he has the past couple of years, a little hand injury that might make him miss a game or two or so on and so forth. That safety net of having Mac Jones as your backup quarterback and Mac Jones has shown that he can take a team to the playoffs because he did it for New England in his in his rookie year with Bill Belichick. If Mac Jones, with the quarterback whisper, whisper that Doug Peterson is, can end up capitalizing on that, maybe he'll build his stock so that way he can be traded to be a serviceable starting quarterback for somebody else's team. But it does say something that he actually looks really good in Jacksonville and looked absolutely horrendous in New England. I know Drake May and Jacoby Brissett are still duking it out. Drake May clearly looks better. I'm not going to lie. Jacoby Brissett looks like a backup. Drake May looks like a starter. Let's see. We'll just move forward. The Ravens, I haven't seen anything from the Ravens. Jordan Love looks great. J.J. McCarthy, he's injured. He's out for the year. I don't. I think they're starting Sam Darnold, but Sam Darnold didn't really play much after the game where he, uh, where J- where JJ McCarthy got hurt. Sorry, so didn't really see much from him after after that game. But the Vikings, I think, are going to be in good shape. Jordan Addison, Justin Jefferson, and you have Aaron Jones. I think Aaron Jones plays for the Vikings, if I'm not mistaken. I could be wrong. I just know Green Bay has Josh Jacobs. Yes, I think they do have Aaron Jones. The Vikings didn't lose the game during preseason. Oh, you know, that never means anything, but but that is the thing. I don't know what to make of the Jets because I haven't seen Aaron Rodgers play. Robert Salah made arguably the worst decision in the world by saying, I don't want to play Aaron Rodgers at all. So we want to give the opportunity for him to get another soft tissue injury because he hasn't seen any real contact since the fourth play of the Jets opening season last year. He's he's had a he's had a hell of a training camp from what I've heard and from what I've seen. He's had an amazing training camp, but again, that's still training camp. Joint practices, he looks amazing in joint practices. Again, that's practice. Practice is harder than the game. I understand that. But when it comes to actually being in the game, you can't simulate a game in the realism of the game in practice. You can simulate situations, but you cannot imitate the game, which is why they say when it comes to basketball and football, the best way to get in basketball shape is to play basketball. The best way to get in football shape is to play football. You don't get in football or basketball shape in the weight room. It's either on the court or on the field, and that's in every sport. The Titans are one of my sleepers for this year. 
They're definitely one of my sleeper teams. The Broncos, I got to shout out. Goodness gracious, what is that? Bo Nix. I got to shout out Bo Nix. Bo Nix has looked incredible. I'm still not sold on Sean Payton. I don't care what anybody else says. I'm not sold on Sean Payton. I think Bo Nix is taking advantage of the fact that the Broncos have decent weapons and he's played well in the preseason. He's the first starting quarterback that is a rookie to start for the Broncos since John Elway, and I think the first ever quarterback that is a rookie that Sean Payton has chosen as a starting quarterback. That's all fine and dandy. I still don't trust Sean Payton as a play caller in today's NFL. He is an all-time great. I don't know if he is a great coach today, especially in the division that has John Harbaugh or Jim Harbaugh, Andy Reid, and now... I forgot the Raiders head coach name. I'm going to I'm going to check it now. But in, in in that division, I don't think I don't think anybody's expecting the Raiders to do much inside of the division, but they are tough. Antonio Pierce is his name, sorry. Former NFL player Antonio Pierce. Antonio Pierce will have the Raiders team tough enough to be able to compete, but I don't think anyone actually takes them serious as a competitor within you know, within that division, the AFC West. But that team is always a team that will surprise you. So I think Aiden O'Connell is going to have a solid year with Devontae Adams, and them losing Josh Jacobs was an absolute travesty. I'm still disappointed in the Raiders for actually losing him, but the only thing that that's going to do is put the ball in, in Devontae Adams' hands more. I think – Jacoby Jacoby Myers is going to have another really solid year. Last year, to me, was somewhat of a breakout year for him. For anybody that's betting, if you bet on Jacoby Myers to be an anytime touchdown scorer in your same game parlays, that's one that's almost a guarantee. Hint, hint. That's a sneaky one. But Jacoby Myers, I know they got Alexander Madison from the Vikings as their running back. I don't know how much you trust him as a number one running back. I know Zamir White was very serviceable last year. He was really good when when Josh Jacobs wasn't able to play. And another one of my biggest concerns, of course, is the Browns. Freaky man Watson is healthy. You know, he, he's apparently he looked good in training camp. Didn't really see him in preseason. I was hoping to see him a little bit in preseason. Jerome Ford was an amazing backup running back for Nick Chubb. And Nick Chubb is coming back after week four, I think. I think he's missing the first four weeks, and he's coming back for the next 13, 13, 14, yeah, 14 weeks. So I'm excited to see Nick Chubb back because, to me, Nick Chubb is arguably the best running back in football right now. Anybody who disagrees, you could just look at the tape. I know you might have Derrick Henry, you might have Christian McCaffrey, whoever you might have. If you look at Nick Chubb's tape, it's very evident who he is, especially with how hard he runs that football. But I'm not gonna I'm not gonna I'm not gonna beat a dead horse too much. I got a segment called the Key Fob segment, and this is only for this is only for the preseason. So the key fob segment is basically when you walk up to a building, you put your key fob up to the tag. And it buzzes you in. This is whose key fob still works and whose key fob doesn't work. I'll start with the doesn't work. Uh, number 80, Jalon Calhoun from the from the Detroit Lions. He had a fumbling problem. And especially when you fumble on special teams, special teams is everyone's fighting chance to make it onto the roster. If you can't make it as wide receiver, you can't make it as DB, you could be a third string wide receiver. You could be a fifth string wide receiver who is deemed serviceable because you work hard on special teams. Special teams has been everyone's way to stay on a roster. So if you fumble in on special teams, you're not really doing yourself a huge service. You're doing yourself a massive disservice. So I don't know if his key fob still going to work when you come back to the practice facility. I'm not going to lie to you. Uh, Number 72 from the Ravens, Andrew Voorhees. On the very first pass play of the game, which means if you're playing the first snaps of the game, and this was in week two, if you're playing the first snaps of, of preseason in week two, you have a chance to be a starter. You allowed a sack immediately on the first play, on the first pass play of the game. And I'm not sure how much of a how much of a great game you had after that because the, the highlights are very spotty. The Ravens have not had a lot of highlights in the preseason. I'm not sure if your key fob gonna work when you get back to the facility. I hope it does. 
because the Ravens need all the help that they can get on the offensive line, being that Lamar Jackson needs protection, Derrick Henry needs protection. They got rid of Gus Edwards and and J.K. Dobbins. So whoever else is behind Derrick Henry, they're going to need some run block, uh, run blocking, and Lamar's going to need some pass blocking. So I don't know. I don't know if key fob still works, but I hope it does. Now, for the people whose key fob definitely works, seemingly every kicker has had a really solid preseason. The kickers have been usually the kickers every time you every time you hear about kickers is always something negative. You don't really hear too much positive about kickers anymore because everyone's ready to bash them and demean them while not necessarily giving them their credit for when they do do great, so to speak. The kickers have been somewhat outstanding for all of the preseason. No complaints, not really a lot of uh of juggles from the holders. Punts being put in great places, kickers kicking 65-yard kicks, 66-yard kicks, 50-some yard kicks. The kickers actually look really good in preseason. A lot of kickers are starting, so you're not really going to see too many backup kickers, you know, try to get a chance at at being serviceable for a roster, especially in today's NFL. The kicker is one of the last people to get hurt. And kickers, and they need kickers. I'm not going to lie. The NFL definitely needs kickers. Shout out Destroying. I hope he gets an opportunity to kick for um, an NFL team. And number eight for the Minnesota Vikings, Tristan, T-R-I-S-H-T-O-N, Jackson. He's looking like a very solid number three option. Of course, you got Justin Jefferson. Of course, you got Jordan Addison. I'm not sure if they still have, the only reason why I know this, oh, K.J. Osborne. I'm not sure if they still have K.J. Osborne, but Tristan Jackson, Tristan, sorry, that is a tough name to pronounce. T. Jackson is what I'm going to call him. T. Jackson has... He was the number one wide receiver during week two in the preseason. And not only was he the number one option, every time a ball hit his hands, it didn't hit the ground. And he was good with yak. He was getting yards after the catch. He was running very solid routes to create five to six yards of separation on DBs. And some of these DBs, I think, were starting DBs. So he looks like a really, really, really nice addition to an already very solid wide receiver room in Minnesota. And just giving Sam Darnold more weapons to throw to, with that many degrees of separation with Jordan Addison, Justin Jefferson, KJ Osborne, as well as now Tristan Jackson, T Jackson, Mr. Jackson, your key fob definitely still works, sir. The Minnesota Vikings need you as well as if they cut you, somebody else going to pick you up. So if your key fob don't work, you're going to get a new key fob in the mail by the time you get home. Now my, my picks shout out fan duel draft Kings underdog sports prize picks. Fanatics, if y'all want to sponsor me, come sponsor your boy. I do have some preseason picks that I will get into in a in a second. I just I just gotta open my DraftKings app. This is not an ad unless I get paid for it, but I'm just letting y'all know, you know, some of the some of the best that I've made. Uh I see a lot of losses as soon as I open the app. Dang. But my off the wall, no, I'm not even gonna give y'all that one. But I have a, a four pick parlay for for week one. For anybody who's, you know, it's a very sneaky parlay. The parlay is Jamar Chase with two touchdowns because I think he's going to get his contract before week one, and they're going to make it their mission to get him as many touches as possible in the blowout game against the Patriots. Jalen Hurts, I think he's going to use the opportunity to go, the opportunity to go against Green Bay as an opportunity to try to make an example out of out of Green Bay, just for the rest of the NFL to be put on notice, I think he's going to have two touchdowns. Yes, Jalen Hurts, two touchdowns. I think Justin Jefferson, first game back in MetLife Stadium against the New York Giants, terrible team. Justin Jefferson is going to get two touchdowns. And B. John Robinson against the Pittsburgh Steelers. I don't have the Falcons winning that game, but I do have B. John Robinson getting two touchdowns because – the Steelers defense can be susceptible to multi to to two way to multi tooled running backs. So if you got a running back who can run the ball as well as uh catch passes out of the backfield, you could probably get over on Pittsburgh because the secondary hasn't always proven to be the strongest. So I have B. John Robinson getting two touchdowns and the odds for that plus six hundred thirty one thousand seven hundred. <laughs> so if you if you're curious about that pick, I'm not going to get into the rest of my picks, but yes. Now for 
one thing that I really wanted to get into before I move on to the Brian Flores and Tua Tonga Valoa segment of the show. Week one predictions. Oh, excuse me. My week one. Well, I guess I could put my week one. No, I'll, I'll do them now because this is a this is a different type of topic because it refers to it refers to the to the treatment or mistreatment or you know there was really this segment is covering the response to what Stephen A said about about how Tua responded and about Brian Flores Brian Flores's case against the NFL. So I'll do my week one picks. Ravens versus the Chiefs. That's September fifth on Peacock at eight twenty. I think that's a Thursday night game. Oh goodness gracious! They're playing in Kansas City. I got the Chiefs winning that game. I think it's. I you know what? I'll say it. I don't think it's going to be a close game. I think Xavier Worthy, being their new deep threat, is going to have an amazing game. I think he's going to be a shoe in for Offensive Rookie of the Year. I think Xavier Worthy is going to have probably at least 100 yards in that game. I think Travis Kelsey is going to have a pretty good game. I think I think the, the Chiefs' run game is going to be relatively slept on. So Isaiah Pacheco, him coming out of the backfield, and of course, Patty just being Patty. I don't think it's going to be a huge shootout of a game, being that I did say I don't think it's going to be close. I'm thinking more of a 24-7 type of game. Early scoring, later stalemate. I don't I don't see the Chiefs defense, despite them losing their best corner, I don't see the Chiefs defense taking so much of a back seat that they wouldn't be able to to contain Trey Flowers along with um goodness gracious, I'm <laughs> Trey Flowers, Zay Flowers along with Derrick Henry and Lamar Jackson. They've been they they were a very stout run defense to to close the year last year, and their pass defense I, I have faith that it's still going to be great. Yeah, they had the number one corner, but they also had great pass defense on both sides of the field. So I think I think it's not going to be that close of a game. Ravens start on one. I do think the Ravens are are you know they're usually a shoe when they have a good season. I don't think it's going to be a good start. I think the Chiefs are going to start this year with the bang just to let everyone know that they are coming to three-peat this year. Then we got the Packers and the Eagles. I think the Packers might start off a little bit slow. Jordan Love is now developed into a really good quarterback, but teams got film on him now. So I think regular season, the Eagles have to get to the passer. The Eagles have to rush the passer. That is the only way the Eagles will be the team that we saw two years ago. Forget Jalen Hurts, forget Saquon Barkley. The Eagles have to rush the passer in order to cover up all the holes that they have in their secondary. In order for my prediction to be accurate of the Eagles winning this in in a close one, the Eagles have to get to the passer, and Jordan Love has to be thrown off his... He has to be thrown off of the platform that he's going to try to stand on for almost the whole game. Jordan Love... Can get he can get outside the pocket and he can run the ball very effectively, but if they're trying to rely on that, or if they can't get to the passer and then they allow the play action to go crazy because the Packers now have Josh Jacobs arguably top three running back in the NFL now, it's going to be a very long day for the Eagles. But I think the Eagles are going to start strong the same way that they did last year. So I got the Eagles winning that game and it's at home. I don't think they're going to lose at home. <laughs> I don't, well, hold on, is it at home or is it in Brazil? Oh, I forgot about that. I don't know where Corinthians Arena is, but I know for a fact that is not, that is not in Philly. <laughs> let me, let me look up Corinthians Arena. Corinthians Arena. I th- yes, that is the game in Brazil. Okay, that's a weird game. So I take it back. Green Bay probably wins that game being that it's not in Philly. So Green Bay beating the Eagles, I'll have that one as a close contest. Cardinals versus Bills, I got a shocker here. I think the Cardinals are going to come out and set the tone against the Bills. I think the Cardinals have a solid, a decent roster. Marvin Harrison Jr. is set to have a really good game. I think Josh Allen is still going to be adjusting to only having James Cook to, to, to get the ball to. I think Dawson Knox is going to have a good year, as well as Dalton Kincaid. I think they're both going to have a good year this year, but... Two tight ends 
with hardly any wide receivers only worked for one team and that team still had Wes Welker and or Julian Edelman. So I, I can't I can't give the Bills as much credit as the Patriots had when they had Aaron Hernandez and Rob Gronkowski. I, I can't do that. Now, the Cardinals with Kyler Murray coming back, Marvin Harrison Jr. and then them having James Conner. Goodness, I don't know why I drew a blank with his name. <laughs> I hope James Conner is the right name, but for, for them having Conner coming out of the backfield, one of the toughest runners in the league that's not a premier running back, the the run game that bullied Dallas last year as a surprise, and then on defense, they still got some things to figure out, but the Bills also have an, off, off, have an offense to figure out, and I know they're going to be at home in Buffalo, but I do have the Bills struggling in that game and possibly giving up that game of week one. I mean, they lost week one to the New York Jets without Aaron Rodgers, you know, on the last play in overtime. So I think if the Cardinals stay healthy through the whole game, I think the Cardinals have a chance to upset the Bills early. The Bills got to figure it out, and it's okay. I think they will. The Bengals and the Patriots, y'all already know, I got Jamar Chase getting two touchdowns against the Bills. I mean, sorry, against uh, against the Patriots. This game is more than likely going to be a blowout. I don't see Drake May having the greatest debut if he does if he is a starting quarterback for the Patriots. So, yeah, this one's going to be a tough one, but I do view it as more than likely going to be a blowout. Bengals over the Patriots, and they're playing at home. Vikings, Giants, this one's going to be a blowout. Daniel Jones probably going to throw two or three interceptions. Kevin O'Connell being the being the the former quarterback that he is and being the coach of the Minnesota Vikings, I have faith that Sam Darnold will play really well in his debut against the New York Giants. Tennessee Titans versus Chicago Bears. I do have the Bears winning this game, but the Titans are my sleeper. So on betting, if you're betting on this game, bet on Caleb Williams to have 250 passing yards, two touchdowns, bet on Keenan Allen and DJ Moore to get a touchdown, maybe DJ Moore to get two touchdowns, who knows. Bet on DeAndre Swift to get at least 70 yards rushing. Take those bets, but DeAndre Hopkins, Calvin Ridley, and there's another wide receiver that I'm that I'm missing from their depth chart, but Will Levis showed that he wasn't a terrible quarterback. He showed that he was actually a decent quarterback and very serviceable quarterback for a team that was actually supposed to be tanking last year. The Titans seemingly were were tanking last year. And now Calvin Ridley <laughs> Calvin Ridley coming to the Tennessee Titans makes a bit of a difference with that team. So they got Tyler Boyd. I forgot about Tyler Boyd. Goodness gracious. They have Tyler Boyd, Traylon Burks, DeAndre Hopkins, and Calvin Ridley as their wide receivers. Tight end with a Conku. He's a solid tight end. Very good tight end to use on Madden. <laughs> just, 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 just mind you. Offensive line, I'm not really sure how well their offensive line is going to hold up. Peter Skaronsky, uh, pretty good offensive lineman. Pretty good, pretty good tackle to have on your team, but... They got Tony Pollard. Tajay Spears actually was a really, really good backup running back for Derrick Henry last year. So if you don't know about Tajay Spears, for everyone who had Derrick Henry, like guaranteed over 60, 70 yards rushing every game in all of their betting for the over-under, they had over for Derrick Henry, and he always hit the under. There was a guy by the name of Tajay Spears that would always hit over that 55-yard mark and get a touchdown in the game. He, every time you thought Derrick Henry was, Derrick Henry was going to get a touchdown, Nope, that was Tajay Spears down at the one yard line, pushing pushing uh, through the goal line. But Tony Pollard, I think, is going to be very serviceable for the run the run game and and their passing game. Just because he came from Dallas, I think he has something to prove coming from Dallas. Being that Dallas has been known to to not have an actual RB one, Tony Pollard is going to come to Tennessee as an RB one fighting for respect, along with Will Levis as their quarterback. So. On this podcast, Titans beating the Bears. And my betting, I'm not going to lie, Bears beating the Titans. Forgive me, but I'm, <laughs> that's me being honest. Panthers and Saints, um, I have both of those teams winning and the fans losing if you watch that game. Uh, nobody needs to watch the Panthers versus Saints. Nobody needs to watch Derek Carr versus Bryce Young, I promise you. They do have you know players like Rashid Shaheed and, and Chris Olave, two really good wide receivers, Alvin Kamara. 
they got Cam Jordan. I know they got Chase Young now for uh, on the New Orleans Saints. All of these players on the New Orleans Saints. The New Orleans Saints have had a very solid roster for a pretty good amount of time, but they have been ridiculously underperforming for the past couple of years. So Panthers and Saints, I got the Saints winning that game, but ultimately that's a game where you check the box score every now and again. You don't look at the game. Steelers and Falcons. I got the Steelers winning this game because I think the Falcons have an uphill battle trying to get all of the first stringers on the same page. Not really because of a short offseason or anything like that, but Kirk Cousins is coming off of an Achilles injury, and he's what almost 40 years old. So you got Kirk Cousins being the older quarterback in the league coming off of an Achilles injury, a completely ruptured Achilles, with a brand-new team, brand-new roster, brand-new playbook, all of these things, with Justin Fields and Russell Wilson. I think Russell Wilson's going to start with Russell Wilson having the playbook probably more under wraps than Kirk Cousins does having reps with the first team having reps with the second team having reps in preseason I think the Steelers no pun intended still won uh, week one against the Falcons because I know the Falcons are you know projected to be at least a 10 win team this upcoming season the Jaguars and the Dolphins I got the Dolphins winning I think two is going to come out in you know to to the next topic I think he's going to come out and and try to make a statement, especially with, you know, all his recent comments about Brian Flores, along with people saying, hey, you can't play in any weather outside of weather that's at least 70 degrees. You can't win any games against any good teams. I think, you know, Jacksonville is supposed to be a playoff team this year. I think they're going to be a decent team in the in the future, even though they lost Calvin Ridley. I think that's ultimately going to be their biggest struggle. Christian Kirk got hurt last year, and Calvin Ridley has is obviously a number one receiver arguably one of the most dangerous receivers to play against as a DB in the NFL. Calvin Ridley, his speed is something that you can never prepare for. His speed is quickness. The fact that even in motion, he runs 100%. It's something that you can't prepare for. That's no longer in Jacksonville. They got Christian Kirk that they paid a boatload of money to. And now you're going against Tyreek Hill and Jalen Waddle with Tua throwing, you know, throwing the ball, a very accurate passer, Mike McDaniels. Uh, being, you know, being the genius offensive mind and genius coach that he is, at least a reputation for being that. The Texans versus Colts. If I'm betting on the game, I got the Texans. But if you want to look for an upsetter, Anthony Richardson making a comeback. I think Anthony Richardson, along with Jonathan Taylor, you know, making making their comeback and making, you know, I'm not going to say their debut, but making their first full season debut if they can both stay healthy. I think it would be I think it would be safe to say that the Colts could very well upset them. They got a very good defense in Zaire Franklin and and all of those guys in their front seven. The the Colts have a much more solid all around team than a lot of people might might project if you're if you're a casual football watcher. They have a really good offense with Michael Pittman Jr. being a being a very being a very good number one option at wide receiver. Anthony Richardson throwing the ball has had his difficulties. So you throw an interception in preseason, you get frowned upon. But him running the ball and him being a freak athlete the way that he is is exactly what the Colts need to put them over the threshold of having mediocre quarterback play. You got a quarterback who can do a little bit of everything, and you could compete in these tough football games. And the Texans, I don't think they're going to have a hangover, but if you are betting on this game, you got Stephon Diggs, Tank Dell, and and CJ Stroud. You got, I think Bernard Pierce is there. Is there a running back? The young guy who looked like he was he was on pace to run for over fifteen hundred yards his rookie year, but you know injuries have injuries have really riddled the Texans. So the Texans are the only. The Texans are the only team who were riddled with injuries as much as they were last year, and they still surpassed all expectations that anybody had for them, especially with the rookie quarterback. I just want to run over their depth chart. So Damian Pierce, sorry. Damian Pierce, they got Joe Mixon starting their running back from the Cincinnati Bengals. Yes, they have him. Stephon Diggs, Robert Woods. Robert Woods is a solid pickup. Nico Collins, Noah Brown, and Tank Dell. They do have a lot of very solid wide receivers, along with Dalton Schultz at tight end. 
if you're just looking at tight end, you know, of course, with Laramie Tunsil being arguably the best, uh, one of the best tackles, Shaq Mason being a very, uh, a very good to great guard, their defense being being strong, their defense being very solid because they have a defensive minded head coach, a young and defensive minded head coach from that San Francisco 49 coaching forty nine er coaching tree. After after looking at it again, like I said, if I'm betting on it. I'm betting Texans, but, you know, Colts. Colts are always a, a sleeper cell team. Raiders and Chargers. Nah. I'm going to go with the Raiders to win that game. Not because I don't have any faith in Justin Herbert, but I do have more faith in the Raiders roster than a lot of than a lot of other people do. I'm, I'm pretty sure I, I wouldn't be surprised if I was a minority in that. But, I mean, Zamir White with Alexander Madison, Devontae Adams, Jacoby Myers, Trey Tucker, who I think is going to have somewhat of a breakout year. I think he's going to have close to 900 to 1,000 yards receiving this year just because he's a deep threat, and I think their quarterback, Aiden O'Connell, I don't know if Gardner Minshew is going to hold up as a first as as a starter because I think Aiden O'Connell is, is, a, is a little bit of a more solid option than Gardner Minshew. And I think with, you know, with some time, with some time under him, and and some more tools under his belt that I think he's acquired from being a starting quarterback last year, I think Aiden O'Connell is the real starter for the Las Vegas Raiders. But again, Gardner Minshew, Minshew magic is a thing. So, Brock Bowers, Michael Mayer, good one-two tight end tandem. Trey Tucker, Jacoby Myers, Jalen Guyton was was pretty decent last year, and Devontae Adams. Of course, on the defense, you got Max Crosby. And that's about it. <laughs> you got you got Mad Max. I know I know they had a they had a nice one two punch last year, but no longer. So it's just Max Crosby. But I, I do think that because of Antonio Pierce being a defensive minded coach, their defense will be solid. Their offense is is what I worry about the most. And the Chargers just cleaned house. I don't know if the Chargers really expect to be that good this year. I think Justin Herbert might have a really good individual season, but I don't think I don't think it's going to amount to wins. So I have the Raiders beating the Chargers week one, Broncos and Seahawks. Oh, uh, this is a tough one. I didn't know this was the matchup for week one. This is a very tough one. I mean, you got you got Geno Smith versus Bo Nix. You got you got Kenneth Walker for um as a running back for for the Seattle Seahawks, DK Metcalf, Tyler Lockett, Jackson Smith and Jigbo who I think is going to have an amazing second season. Noah Fant, hopefully he can stay healthy because that's one pick from the that they got from the Broncos that I expected to have a really good season with Seattle but you know again it's a league where you just got to stay healthy. The best ability is availability. And you know what? I'll go with Seattle. Seattle over Denver. I think Bo Nix is is you know, Bo Nix is in a, is in a place where he's going to have to do more learning than executing, and he's learning on the fly. I think Bo Nix will be another candidate for offensive rookie of the year toward the end of the year, probably top five candidate. But I got the Seahawks winning that game. Cowboys and Browns. I got the Browns smacking the Cowboys. I think Deshaun Watson is going to be healthy for that game. If Deshaun Watson is healthy for that game, C.D. Lamb still has to get used to contact and the fact that they're playing one of the most physical and one of the most daunting defenses in the league like I stated earlier that being the introduction to the year easy 0-1 for the Cowboys now because there's not really you know as much expectations I can see the Cowboys turning it around Mark McCarthy is a very good regular season head coach Dak Prescott is a very good regular season quarterback but they don't have any running backs their offensive line, questionable, spotty at times. And we're talking about Miles Garrett. We talk about Zadarius Smith, who just came from Dallas. Devin Bush, Denzel Ward, Grant Delpit. Goodness gracious, Juan Thornhill. We got Greg Newsom as well. It's tough, and that's just on the defense. If we go to the offense, we still talk about Deshaun Watson, who should be healthy. Hey, Jameis Winston, if Deshaun Watson ain't healthy, Jameis Winston did throw 5,000 yards and 30 touchdowns. Yeah, he had 30 interceptions too, but 5,000-yard quarterback as a backup quarterback, pretty good to have. Nick Tubb is out, so that means Jerome Ford would be in. And, 
I mean, they got they got a pretty. I think they got Deontay Foreman on their on their roster as well. Pretty good running back, but Cedric Tillman backing up Amari Cooper. They got Jerry Judy. They got Elijah Moore, who was actually a really good wide receiver last year. A uh, really good wide receiver to bet on too last year. Um, just for you know the active betters. And David Njoku, one of my one of one of the better tight ends in the league, probably a top five tight end in the league today. David Njoku rounding out the weapons for Deshaun Watson for freaky man to throw to. Yeah, that's a that's an easy 30 to 14 game. That's an easy uh 37 to 37 to 14, 37 to 17 game. I don't see Michael Parsons being able to break through and disrupt that game. So I I most definitely have the Cowboys winning that game. I'm not the Cowboys, sorry. I most definitely have the Browns winning that game. Commanders and Buccaneers. Ooh. Now, the Commanders I think are going to have probably a 9 a 9 to 10 win season. Yeah, call me crazy. But 8 to 10 win season. And this is just going to be one of those games that I think they'll lose. Baker Mayfield, confident, sheriff in town, new sheriff in town. Mike Evans, Chris Godwin, both healthy. If Chris Godwin can stay healthy for the whole season, Tampa could actually make the playoffs. But Chris Godwin, Mike Evans, Cade Otten at tight end. Uh, I think Rashad White is the name of the running back. I could, I can't really. Pre- I know. I think it's Rashad something. It's R A C, R A C. Um, yeah, yeah, R A C H A D. Rashad White. They got Chase Edmonds, also a very solid option at running back as well. But Mike Evans, Chris Godwin, as their main one-two punch at wide receiver. I think Trey Palmer is gonna stick around. He's gonna be there. I really wish they would have kept Scotty Miller, because I think. I think the Steelers have Scotty Miller, if I'm not mistaken. And Scotty Miller is a burner. But Cade Otten and Cole Keefe, I know Cole Keefe was one of their uh was one of their hopefuls to be, you know, a a a breakout rookie tight end. Probably the ugliest number on the team being forty one on offense. That's a nasty number. But their defense is always solid when you have Todd Bowles as your coach. So I mean, they still got Levante, David. I think they do still have Vita Vea. They got Bryce Hall back there coming from the New York Jets. They still got Jamel Dean. They still got Jordan Whitehead and Anton and uh, Antoine Whitfield Jr. Goodness gracious, I remember when his dad used to play. Dang. Um, but, yeah, they do still have Vita Vea, K.J. Britt, really good linebacker, came from the Titans. I got Tampa winning that game. And and I'm not I'm not ashamed to say it. I, I really do have Tampa winning that game, but I think it's going to be because Washington is going to have to stumble out of the gate a little bit. And I think Tampa is the perfect team to smack them in the mouth while they're stumbling out the gate. Detroit and L.A. The Rams. I think the Rams are going to lose that game to Detroit, but I do have the Rams actually winning that division. I just think they're going to come out slow because Aaron Donald, being arguably the greatest defensive player ever, you know, of course him and Lawrence Taylor, but easily the greatest defensive player of our generation somebody who's made the pro bowl and made all and um and made all defense every year that he's played it's going to be hard to fill that void even though they have two people that I think is supposed to make up for the one you got the lions who are easily the most physical team in football I know people have the ravens as that but if you watch David Montgomery run that football and you watch Jameer Gibbs run that football and you watch how their offensive line rallies around the quarterback and pushes the line of scrimmage the Detroit Lions are easily the most physical team in football I think the Lions win that game maybe convincingly I'm not sure Sean McVay is a great coach so he might make it a little interesting and the Jets and the 49ers I'll be the person to say it I think the 49ers are going to start slow because you have too many people not taking reps with Brock Purdy and I think Brock Purdy is not going to be the issue in this game I think it's going to be the continuity and the Jets probably being more prepared to shine in this moment. I don't know how long the moment is going to last, but I think the Jets will be ready. Barring health, Aaron Rodgers has seen this 49ers team time and time again, and he has gotten his you-know-what handed to him time and time again by this very same 49ers team. I do think that he gets over on them because it's regular season. I can see Aaron Rodgers beating the 49ers in the regular season, but in the playoffs... If this is a Super Bowl matchup, we got some concern because they'd be meeting in the playoffs again. But regular season, 
I got faith that Aaron Rodgers can go in to the 49ers stadium and get a W against San Francisco 49ers. I have faith that Christian McCaffrey will probably cook, but I don't think Debo Samuels is going to have a, a huge game. If Brandon Ayuk decides to resign, I don't think he's going to have a huge game. I know Jawan Jennings is also a good wide receiver. He's probably going to get locked up too. I don't have the Jets defense is such a start such a such a, a vaunting defense. All they needed was decent quarterback play. Aaron Rodgers is probably going to throw for at least 3,500 yards this year. So they're going to have beyond decent quarterback play this year. I got the Jets beating the 49ers in week one. This is not to say that the Jets are going to be the best team in the NFL. I just have them. It, it's any given Sunday, as it always is. I have the Jets beating the 49ers week one. That is my wrap-up for my week one predictions. Now... Let's get back to this other topic of Tua Tungavailoa versus Brian Flores, something that is something that has started recently. Stephen A. and the other cast members of First Take covered this topic. Tua came out and said, just picture you having someone in your life every time you wake up tell you you're nothing, you're not good at your job, you suck. Somebody else should be in your position, not you. You didn't earn it. You're not good enough. Versus waking up the next morning and having someone say, you're the exact person that I've needed and that I've been looking for. You're great. You're amazing. You're you're perfect. All of those things. What he was speaking to was someone speaking life into you versus someone not speaking life into you. Someone speaking ill and negative to you every chance that they get. And, I mean, if you have a heart, if you have emotions, what two is saying is is accurate because you don't want to wake up and hear discouragement every morning. You don't want to go to your job and hear your boss trash you every moment that they get a chance to. I mean, yeah, did they technically have a winning record in back-to-back seasons? Yeah, technically they did, but the Dolphins seemingly fired Brian Flores for winning a game that they weren't supposed to win. So in this suit, right, Stephen A. says this makes things interesting for the suit that Brian Flores has against the NFL in which he said that he wasn't being hired because he was African-American and he was being discriminated against. So now it comes out that Tua says this dude is a horrible person and he wasn't a good coach. Or he was a decent coach, but he was a terrible person. So despite however good I am at my job, if I have attendance issues or if I have issues with morale and I'm working within a network of people who all keep in contact with each other, if word gets out about me, I don't care how good at my job I am. If I'm not bringing back the absolute greatest results, in which this case would be a Super Bowl, if I'm not guaranteed to win my team a Super Bowl, Nobody's entitled to hire me and ruin the morale of the building. One thing that Brian Flores has in common with Josh McDaniels, maybe Bill O'Brien, I'm not sure. I haven't really heard too much about Bill O'Brien. And Matt Patricia, they're all under the Bill Belichick tree of people who became head coaches from being known as amazing assistant coaches. I'm sorry that y'all have to hear this damn dog barking in the background over and over again. I don't know who dog that is, but they all have something in common of being under the Bill Belichick head coaching tree. The Bill Belichick head coaching tree has been known up until this point to be what it is because of Tom Brady and because of Bill Belichick and Tom Brady's willingness to work with one another, despite, you know, everyone looking like, wow, he talked to Tom Brady like that? Good. I can't believe he talked to Tom like that. He yelling at him, cussing at him, doing he embarrassing him in front of everybody. He doing that to Tom? Oh man, if I was Tom, I don't know how he'd do it. I don't know how he does it. Six Super Bowls is how he does it. Going to six Super Bowls or going to ten Super Bowls and winning six is how he does it. Yeah, when you got those kind of results. Being the greatest quarterback ever and understanding if I can sell everyone on this dream, yeah, we can do great things beyond me getting cussed out in practice because the result I want to see, I don't care about what he's saying to me in practice. I care about the results in the game. So if he has a point in what he's saying, 
all of us, let's follow this. Let's blindly follow this. Let's ignore our humanistic aspects and instincts to have emotional responses to things. And let's program as our and let's program ourselves to this one goal, this trophy. We'll worry about our personal things when we get to the offseason. You know, of course, people will say that's why he's single now. <laughs> it is what it is. The job comes with it. But when when you're him in that job. When you're him in that job, it comes with that a lot of the times. It comes with a lot of sacrifice that seems unreasonable until you see someone do something that has never been done before. Seven Super Bowl rings as a starting quarterback in the NFL. He has more Super Bowl rings than any franchise. Him as an individual has more Super Bowls than any franchise. That's crazy. He's the Bill Russell of football at this point. And if he wanted to come back and win another ring, Hey, who knows? He might be able to. <laughs> I know he's been he's been bidding to be an owner of the of the Las Vegas Raiders. If it comes out that he want to play football for the Las Vegas Raiders, that he want to throw to Devontae Adams, ah, NFL is now going to have to consider <laughs> the <laughs> the Las Vegas Raiders as a Super Bowl contender because that man is on the field. And one thing that doesn't translate very well is when you leave the tree and you no longer have Tom Brady. Matt Patricia went to go coach Matt Stafford. Brian Flores went to go draft Tua Tonga Valoa, even though he wanted Justin Herbert. Either way, Justin Herbert is not Tom Brady, as, as we've seen. But he ended up getting Tua Tonga Valoa, and Josh McDaniels had Derek Carr. Every quarterback that I named, you might notice one thing about it. They don't wear number 12, and their name isn't Tom Brady. <laughs> those are two things that those all those quarterbacks that I just named don't have in common with the person who was also considered the GOAT. When you try to coach them the same way that you coach the GOAT, if you're not getting GOAT results, you're not going to get the belief that you got of those people that saw the GOAT. So no, they don't have GOAT aspirations or GOAT beliefs if you're not getting the GOAT results. And none of those coaches were able to get those once they left Bill Belichick. All of them have had the same reputation. They treat their players like crap. They don't know how to talk to other grown men. And players genuinely don't like them, along with the fact that they're not winning football games, so they can't even ignore the fact that they don't like that they don't like to coach. Because you'll ignore somebody you don't like when the results are the results. But when the results are these results, no, I'm not going to ignore morale. If I'm getting paid and we not winning, I'm at least going to have fun at my job. Hey, 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 listen, if we not having fun, we better be winning. And if we not winning, something need to be fun. You're not going to be that serious and talk to me this kind of way. If we not doing nothing, if we're going to finish the year five and 12, there is no way you're going to call me out of my name as a grown man at all. 12 and five AFC championship. All right, I'll, I'll quiet down. I'll, I'll pull you to the side. Hey, Coach, can you kind of lay off just a little bit? I'll talk to you on the side, but nah. If if it's four and if it's four and thirteen, I'm gonna stand up in the meeting and say, "Hey, Coach, you gonna have to learn how to talk to us as grown men, respectfully, because we trash right now, and we trash because you don't know what you're doing." So, Brian Flores now falls into this category, and being that Brian Flores falls into this category, I 100% understand Stephen A. Smith saying this could affect his suit. Because when you're in a case, you're in a lawsuit, everyone immediately wanted to run to see, here goes Stephen A. Smith trying to collect his check from the NFL. If you understand anything about a suit, if you have evidence that could affect the case, you use it. So in this case, the suit is y'all were blackballing me because I am a black coach and y'all are not giving black coaches fair opportunities in the league. Mike Tomlin threw you a life raft to be able to give you a defensive coordinator job. And now you're a defensive coordinator for the, uh, for the Minnesota Vikings. Mike Tomlin threw you that life raft. Mike Tomlin throwing you that life draft should have said a lot. It didn't say a lot to me in the moment because I didn't know any of this, but now it says a lot. Hey, listen, Brian, I heard some of the things that, that I've been hearing. Because coaches talk, GMs talk, owners talk. It's not a large enough network of them for them to get lost in the sauce. Like it's, it's not enough for them to get lost in between the cracks. They talk to one another. They speak. They congregate. They meet. They discuss a lot of things. They discuss y'all. They discuss all types of... The fact that a trade can happen without anyone knowing about it, if the owner or GM so pleases, that should let you know that they have those conversations off to the side. And off to the side... 
hey, man, our players hate Brian Flores. Brian Flores talks to Tua like this. He talks to Jalen Waddle like this. He talks to he talks to this person like this. He But really, he's been picking on Tua pretty badly. And Tua, it's shaking Tua's confidence. And I think Tua's a good quarterback. But Brian Flores has Tua Tungvaluwa not even believing in himself. If you were able to do that to a first-round pick out of Alabama – who won a national championship. I think Tua won a national championship. Yeah, he did because he replaced Jalen Hurts. The guy who replaced Jalen Hurts, who just went to the Super Bowl a couple years ago, mind you, the guy that replaced him, you got his confidence shook, and he is unable to perform with you as his head coach. As a matter of fact, if he's kind of injured, he'd rather just sit so that way he doesn't have to hear it from you. With the owners all knowing that, do you think any owners or GMs want to bring that guy into their locker room? This is the argument that NFL owners would make on the behalf of their case. Because now you have a lawsuit against these owners. <laughs> you have a lawsuit against 31 billionaires. Yes, they're going to use all of this as ammunition. They're going to say these are the conversations that they have been having behind closed doors. That is what they're going to say. Now, whether it'll hold up or not, totally on them. You know, that, that's, that's to be determined. But what Stephen A. Smith was saying was this makes that case interesting if they decide to use that as proof as to why he was not a serviceable enough option to be a coach for our organization because this was his reputation around the league. And he cut off his own nose despite his face and shot him own self in, shot his own self in the foot for being able to receive any opportunities that we were willing to give. Yes, we sat down with him and we talked with him. But us sitting down with him was to more so gauge what happened in Miami. And the answers that we got, hey, listen, it's been nice speaking with you. We're going to go in a different direction. It wasn't because you got on the boat with Tom Brady and, and, we, and we had a mission to make Tom Brady an owner and, and, and they were tampering. Hey, that, that punishment was already levied. The GMs get punished for that. It wasn't because you won a game on you know on purpose so that way you could ruin their draft selection. No, nah, what it's a lot of things that lead up until that point for you to be that person. Your team was not that good before you got to that point. Mike McDaniel comes in, goes out and gets Tyreek Hill. Tyreek Hill is the reason why that franchise has turned around the way that it has, if we're being totally honest. But Mike McDaniel being open and giving his quarterback enough confidence to be the number one quarterback in passing yards. You can have Tyreek Hill, but if you can't throw it, don't mean nothing. We watched, I think his name was Kerry Collins. I'm going to look it up. Randy Moss, before he played, Randy Moss before he played, yes, that's who it is. Randy Moss before he played for the Patriots, before he broke the NFL all-time record of receiving touchdowns in a season. Before he did that in New England, he played for Tennessee. I don't know how many people remember that. He played for the Tennessee Titans. Sorry, no, he played for the Oakland Raiders. Huh, silly me. He played for the Oakland Raiders where Kerry Collins was the starting quarterback at, at the Oakland Raiders. In practice, Randy Moss has a, if you know Randy Moss and you watch him play, you've seen his footage, he doesn't look at the quarterback when he calls for the ball. Whatever side he's running on, he sticks his outside hand in the air to let you know that he's won his matchup. Just throw it up. He'll go get it. Boom, beat the DB, throw his arm up. He'll go get it. Kerry Collins is looking and trying to gauge, ah, he's not really open. And then he'll throw it to somebody else despite how many times Randy had his hand up. So now Randy is looked at as a washed receiver because he had a washed quarterback throwing him the ball. He goes to the New England Patriots, and that's all she wrote. Did he get a ring? No. He at least made it to a Super Bowl, <laughs> but he didn't get a ring. But he did break the single-season record in receiving touchdowns. So what, what, we're, what we probably saw as a culmination of the two things, Brian Flores and Tua, Dolphins fans didn't even want Tua there when Brian Flores was coaching. Now we get Mike McDaniel, and not only does Tyreek have – was he on pace to be a 2,000-yard receiver? Tua led the league in passing for almost a whole year. They had arguably the number one offense in the league for almost a whole year. Did they do that well against playoff teams? No, you know, continuity with coaches and coordinators, we, can call, we could call it that. But the fact that that much progress was made in that time, in that, in that short period of time, 
Tua didn't just get good overnight. He didn't just become a really good and top five quarterback overnight. As far as stats go, you know, I don't think he's a top five quarterback, but as far as stats go, he was top five. He didn't become that overnight. Tyreek Hill didn't just by himself trans, you know, transfer that to him overnight because if you cover Tyreek Hill, you still got other weapons. I think Jalen Waddle had a thousand yards last year. I, yeah, I think Jalen Waddle was a thousand yard receiver last year. So you got two thousand yard receivers in in one offense. I understand it's because you know, um, Tyreek is taking some of the attention. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All that, all the good stuff. But seventy two receptions and a thousand and fourteen yards, averaging fourteen, uh, averaging fourteen yards of reception. That's a good backup. That's a good backup option to have. And for you to have 2,000-yard receivers, you got to have a quarterback who's able to get them the ball. Yeah, he only had four touchdowns, but Tyreek had a, you know, <laughs> Tyreek had a really good season. Then you got Devon A. Chan and, and you got, what is it, uh, Jeff Jones Jr. The, the, Miami, the Miami, Miami had probably the deepest and fastest running back core last year. I'll make sure I'll get the name of, of the gentleman who, who played running back for them. But you have... <clears throat> oh, excuse me, Jeff Wilson Jr. I said Jeff Jones. Jeff Wilson Jr. You got Raheem Mostert, Devon A. Chan, and Jeff Jones, or and Jeff Wilson Jr. And you have Tyreek Hill. You got Jalen Waddle. I know they got Odell this year, but I'm not really anticipating Odell doing much. They got John U. Smith, a very huge pickup for that team. That's a very sleeper pick, but they had Durham Smythe last year. He was a really good tight end. All of these options are very good options to throw the ball to. If the quarterback can get the ball to him, we've seen quarterbacks in really good skill. We've seen quarterbacks that have really good skill positions. We saw Devontae Adams and Josh Jacobs and Jacoby Myers all play on the same team last year. Ask me where the Las Vegas Raiders went. You ain't got eyes, man. Ain't go nowhere. Because Derek Carr didn't play well. Aiden O'Connell also didn't play the greatest. Now they got Gardner Minshew to hope, hopefully turn the tide over there. But again, Brian Flores, if if you were that responsible for holding Tua Tungvaluwa back, you should expect for these owners to now bring this up. If Tua did strengthen their case by giving ammunition to say, hey, this guy was a terrible person, and the word got out, because apparently when he went to these other rosters, you know, Brian Flores, players were asking him, hey, man, I heard about this going on over there. What's up with that? What's going on? Then he comes out, hey, I made some mistakes. You know, I really wish nothing but the best for him. And, and you know, it, it does hurt when someone says that you're a terrible person. And, you know, those I'm a human, so those things hurt. Really good press run answers. Very, very beautifully answered media trained questions. Or very beautifully trained, uh, very beautifully media trained answers for those questions. To Stephen A's point, yeah, that does hurt your case if those people decide to use that because now I have a reason to disqualify you for the job that you were probably qualified for. No longer is it because you're black. It's because did you not just hear how your past quarterback was talking about you? And we saw you. Yeah, we interviewed you, but we couldn't shake this off of what happened there. And, you know, Brian Flores... We're wishing him nothing but the best moving forward. Hopefully he learned his lesson. I think Tua's going to have another really good year. And Stephen A. Smith is not a, a C word, you know, a C-O-O, you know, it's short for raccoon. Stephen A. Smith is not that because he pointed out the obvious in which, hey, you have a lawsuit against the NFL. They're not, if you got a lawsuit against anybody, they're not going to take too kind to you asking them for a job after you file a lawsuit against them. Look at Colin Kaepernick. Now you're filing a lawsuit against the NFL while this reputation precedes you as being a terrible person and being a cancer to a locker room as a coach. Yes, they're going to use that in the lawsuit. They're going to use that against you. Stephen A. Smith is not wrong for saying that. Now, if they don't do it, so be it. Hopefully you get your money and hopefully you hopefully you get the, you know, hopefully justice is served. That's what I'll say to that. 
and I'll end it there. Thank you guys so much for tuning in to episode 22 of the Rough Talk Sports Podcast. I've been your host, Kelvin Ruffin Jr. Don't forget the junior. And tune in after week one because I'm not sure if I'm going to have another episode come out before the end of week one just because there is a little bye week in between. So that would be technically me missing two episodes with me missing last week and me missing next week. But I'm not going to really... I'm not really anticipating much news to come out. If something does happen and a lot of moves are made between now and then, I'll speak more on it next week on the Rough Talk Sports Podcast. Y'all get episode 23 quicker than or sooner than later. But I'm anticipating most of the news to happen after week one. And I'll give y'all, you know, at least an hour and a half worth for content for episode 23. But thank you again for tuning in. Once again, Rough Talk Sports Podcast. I've been your host, Calvin Ruffin Jr. Don't forget the junior. They say talk is cheap, but we have the rough talks. The whole day waiting gold. Enjoy y'all week.